You are listening to Beyond the Verse, a Star Citizen podcast. A show dedicated to Cloud Imperium games, Star Citizen and Squadron 42. Whether you fight, explore, unite, and or trade, we bring you news, updates, interviews, reviews, and analysis. So sit back, relax, grab yourself a pour of Radagast, and join us as we go Beyond the Verse. Launch sequence activated. Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Beyond the Verse podcast. I'm your host, Solus, and we are in episode 49. That's one away from 50. I know it's math. I'm super awesome at it, <laughs> but but it's it's uh, it's paramount because we are coming close to the one year anniversary of Beyond the Verse podcast, and so super excited about that. I've got a couple of fun ideas up my sleeves. Hopefully, they come to fruition, and we get to have a really good episode fifty for next week uh, when we produce our. Uh, our anniversary episode. I think there was two weeks last year I wasn't able to record for family reasons or work reasons, um, hence why it's not 52. That's how that works. <laughs> yeah, I hope this finds everybody well. Welcome into the week. Um, it's been a busy one, some fun avocado updates, um, some amazing tests being done with replication layers splitting. Uh, but for the rest of us, uh, we obviously had this week in Star Citizen on Monday, uh, which talks a little bit about what I just mentioned. We have the March subscriber promotions we'll get into and my reactions uh, to each item. And it kind of hints at March 15th Stella Fortuna event. It's an annual event that basically is St. Patrick's Day, uh, but we'll talk a little bit about that, the lore behind it, uh, previewing for next week. Roadmap Roundup has a couple gold nuggets uh, that I can't wait to get in with you. And then we'll go into the Star Citizen monthly report. Again, not the Squadron 42 monthly report. We're gonna break that up and produce it for next week's episode and then we will end with the reaction to the inside star citizen all things fps video now i haven't watched that inside star citizen yet work has been kicking me square in the crotch all week long so <laughs> i have not been able to really preview um, anything on that video so we're going to watch it live together um, and we're going to react to it together so I'm, I'm actually really excited about that uh, but first from the community let's get into last week's episode 48 community and star citizen uh, where i did ask a q and a i actually didn't ask a poll I only asked a Q&A, and I asked, we'd love to hear your thoughts on the Idris, whether in-game during the event or reactions to the ISC walkthrough, Inside Star Citizens walkthrough. So I got three responses. Let's go through each one from a Dirty Ruckus, who is a uh, cherished member in the Soul Provision organization. Quote, with capital ships coming into the game like the Idris, what type of multi-crew missions would you like to see come to the game? So, um, yeah, he turned that on me. <laughs> I asked the question, and he answers uh, with a question of, of his own. I love it, though. What a great idea. Um, actually, that would be a really good idea for the end of this episode, asking you to ask me anything to talk about for, this, uh, for episode 50 for next week. But for me, when I, when I think about multi-crewing ships... Um, I think the very common answer is like the engineering game loop. I want the inner workings of a ship, right? So when me and my family watched Lost in Space, when I grew up watching, you know, Star Trek and Star Wars, it was life being lived on this ship that attracted me so much to this IP, to the genre, right? So there's something about fighting fires, uh, making sure that the engineering rooms are taken care of. Um, I loved how the Idris has the gravity well, like the the circular room with the open and closing doors that they they showcased. Um, I just I love the idea of living within the ship. Of course, it's super sexy to fly the ship, to get into a turret and shoot. All that is great, 
all that is great. But again, making the ship work, um, and again, living on the ship, I think having a reason and a purpose to sit down in the mess hall and to eat and to drink. Uh, I don't know if that becomes part of the economy where you have to eat and drink. And it already kind of is, but it's, I don't know. You just rest in a bed for like five seconds and you're good to go. Or you drink a cruise drink and it replenishes both. There's not really a mechanic of eating and drinking. Um, but having a reason to sit down and in, in, in fellowship with your org mates in the mess hall, um, again, living and breathing, servicing, working on the ship. Again, I, I also allude to like Star Wars um, when you would watch, you know, Han Solo and his crew working on the Millennium Falcon um, or before or after a, uh, a combat situation, they would be getting their X-Wings and Y-Wings ready. Um, there's all of that that I'm looking forward to. Beyond that, um, of course, distribution centers, of course, anything logistics. Um, so the, the combination of loading uh, inventory into a cargo bay, managing that. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot of that come with the persistent hangers and how cargo management is, is operated or executed in those situations. And then last, um, I, <laughs> well, I'll stop there. I think the <laughs> I'll stop there. The engineering and um, the working on and the cargo distribution centers, uh, persistent hangers, all of that being the multi-crew mission is, is what I'm looking for. I think, and the reason why I stopped and hesitated, I'm really looking forward to exploration as well. And I don't know what that looks like. If you take the Anvil Carrick, the Carrick has a drone room you walk and I forgot which level of the ship it is but you walk into this room you sit in a uh, you sit in a seat and it's a drone operator seat and so I'm starting to like war game what that looks like you know you jump into an orbital marker or maybe an unexplored um, planet system so they don't have orbital markers anywhere but you drop in there and then you explore using drones and again there's something about that entire everything I've said for the last couple minutes there's something about working on the ship and maybe you're putting out fires. Okay, Solas, I need you in the drone operating room. And you, you know, you walk your happy ass up to the, <laughs> the drone room. You sit in the chair and all of a sudden now you're out in space flying these drones into a planet system that may be like a water planet. It's 100% water. And maybe you get a submersible and you have to like, you know, go explore that way. Knowing that you're on the ship, you know, thousands of kilometers away. I think I've kind of exhausted my response to this, but it's that entire existence on a ship loop. And it's, that's a huge ask uh, that I'm looking forward to the most. So great question, loved it. Thank you, Dirty Ruckus. Next quote from Dakota Riley, quote, I may have had a negative opinion on the event, but the Idris is an exciting ship and I can't wait for it to come to the verse for players to own and fly. The Inside Star Citizen Tour gave me confidence in the ship, end quote. Yep, I agree. And, and I, don't, uh, I don't necessarily, I don't think that I had a negative opinion about the event. Was it super easy to, to find, to accept the mission, and when you were there to like take over the ship? Absolutely not. It was, it was horrendous in that sense. But being able to see the community, right, wrong, or indifferent, being able to see the community chase after something that was controlled by the community, I think was a phenomenal, um, a phenomenal event at the end of the day. Got the excitement up. The Inside Star Citizen was expertly timed uh, for those of us who just wanted to see the inside of it, right? So I think it all together was a really good experience. Now, do they need to revisit the details and how it's executed next time? Absolutely. And I think Tyler was all but honest and transparent when he said that on Spectrum, right? There's a lot of learnings, like the gold ticket event for the F8C and now for the Idris event. There's a lot of learnings, and I do hope they evolve the next time that these events happen. 
Last quote from Dreamer of Days. Again, all three of these individuals, cherished members of the Soul Provision Org, quote, haven't had a chance to see it yet, but it sounds like lots of fun. I hope we'll start seeing the Idris as a spawning raid uh, akin to the take back the 890 jump missions, but for co-op. All right, perfect. This is 100% what I had in mind. So I was thinking like having it tourable during Evictus launch week, just like the Javelin, the Warhammer Javelin. I think having it there so we could just walk through it and experience it. But this is another great idea. Crossed my mind, didn't communicate it, um, but let's let's call it their idea. Um, Right now, the 890 jump is a mission in some systems where it's um, been taken over by Xeno Threat. I think it's Xeno Threat. Um, yeah, it's the enemy with the skull, but uh, the skull helmets and everything. So I'm pretty sure it's Xeno Threat. Um, so you fly to it. Usually, you have to take out a couple of enemy combatants, like in space, um, ship on ship. And then once you get, once you board onto the 890 jump, it ends up becoming a first person shooter where you have to kill, I think it's 15 roughly um, enemy. But imagine this on the Idris. So there's a mission, there's a reason why you have to engage in different you know, loops of the game. But then once you clear out the Idris, now you can kind of do the same thing. You can explore. The only hesitation or maybe delay that that would cause is they're just now starting to convert the squadron 42 insides to a bare boned star citizen insides you're asking them now to create a destruction or a you know a a, a, a taken over you know idris so it might be later down the road might be later this year next year but i do think this is a good idea to engage with the Idris uh, and the Star Citizen community. So great answers to this last week's community and Star Citizen episode. I did not end up asking questions on Orgnite, but speaking of Orgnite, a couple of things. I wanna give a quick little shout out to Mustang. Um, Mustang inside of the Soul Provision Org. I'm actually gonna put his, um, his links inside of the show's description, but we have inside Soul Provision, we have what's called the investors. It's those individuals who have decided to give their their time, talents, their disposable income, and put it towards either the Soul Provision Discord, the community, or into this podcast directly. And so they get a special role. It puts them into the investors. And there's, I don't know, there's a, a pretty decent sized group of us. Um, and it's just an avenue. I'm going to poke their their um, their brains a little bit more. I'm going to ask a little bit more questions. Hey, where do you want to see? Because they're investors. They've they've again given so much to this show. Um, I want to be able to leverage that passion. And so I'll ask them questions. Hey, what do you think about rebranding? What do you think about you know X Y Z our tempo and what we do for org nights and you know etc. And so I asked. I charged them to rebrand sole provision and so historically just for precedent uh, or context i had taken the for the community or by the community uh shareable star citizen logo and basically just just put sole provision around it <laughs> like it was not a lot of creativity but i wanted to get the org up and running and didn't really want to think about branding at the current moment well a year later and over a hundred individuals in the org i think it's time we start making it ours And so we developed this really awesome logo. We actually took the frame of a one SCU box, since it's sole provision, uh, and based our logo around that. So Mustang, he took this, ran with it, created brand guides and and everything. It's crazy. So I wanna celebrate, uh, I wanna celebrate him for uh, for what he's been able to accomplish and what he's able to what he's been able to do for us. So Orgnite last night, we announce it, we change our branding, it's official. So that was super exciting, but we also did the illegal version of Jump Town. So last week we did the legal version, it's our second time doing the legal version of Jump Town. So we wanted to change things up a little bit and it took us to Raven's Roost in Microtech, which is a gorgeous, 
gorgeous planet system. It's one of the most beautiful, but we were flying into jump town, sun setting on our what starboard side. Um, and it was just, it was just absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. So go listen to it. That's episode or bonus episode, Org Night 11. Go have fun with that. Um, I did not ask any polls or Q and A's on that one either. So stand by for this episode. It will. All right, let's get going. <laughs> this week in Star Citizen, sharing my screen for those of you on YouTube. Uh, first off, an amazing shot that actually looks. We weren't flying the Carrick. We were flying the 890 jump, but that is very close to an image that Supervision took on our exploration night. Uh, but an amazing picture by Carbon Pixel, phenomenal. It's a carrot flying towards one of the jump points. And the jump point is important because one of the first couple paragraphs I'm gonna be reading. So here we go. Happy Monday, everyone. Last week, we opened the doors to the Evocati for a series of initial server meshing trials, and we're happy to report that it was a success. The playtest involved full-scale static meshing, with one server dedicated to Pyro and another to Stanton, both seamlessly navigating through the replication layer to the same shard. During the five-hour playtest, we encountered only one server crash, and despite a hiccup on the Pyro side of the shard, Stanton, which was running on the same shard, continued seamlessly without any disruptions. Even more encouraging was the swift recovery as Pyro bounced back in just over two minutes. This week, we're aiming to take another big step forward by opening the jump gates between systems for the first time. Incredible. We want to take a moment to thank everyone for participating and just generally for all the support you have shown us over the years. 2024 is shaping up to be really special, and we couldn't have come this far without each and every one of you. We'll see you on the other side. Before I continue on with this week in Star Citizen, just let, let's talk about that. So the replication layer, that's an interesting one because we were told getting into 2024 that this was gonna be like a deliberate rollout, it was gonna happen before server meshing, there'd be a you know a tech preview channel um, experience, and this again, this is all about replication layer, but it sounds like they're doing it simultaneously with server meshing, and you can't really have one without the other, just to be very clear, but it looks like they're testing kind of all three, right replication layer server meshing and even a little bit of the dynamic server meshing when you read some of the notes so this is super exciting right this is very exciting that they're trying it with the evocati which means next my prediction after this is probably going to be the tech preview channel so we'll probably get 323 with all the bells and whistles from squadron 42 simultaneously i predict a tech preview channel will launch uh, for all of us to be trying out replication layer and server meshing. But here's here's kind of a caveat to that. It doesn't really change your playing experience. And, and I just want to be very, like, I guess, clear about that. Like, look how they're testing right now in Evocati. They actually asked the Evocati to go and, and just play like normal. Play like normal for four hours. And if something happens, let's 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 see what happens, right? Um, so there's not like a change in experience, a new loop. Um, it's just the back end and how they're patching kind of shards with shards, and continuing um, the experience when one of the shards or one of the servers goes down. So it's exciting for the future of the game. It's exciting from a tech perspective. Don't get me wrong. It's just I I think. I think the hype and the excitement for this tech is probably going to hit a wall when it launches and everybody's like, oh, okay, well, what's next? <laughs> Again, if you've been following development, if you've been listening to this podcast, we're super excited. It's freaking awesome. Um, other games do have server meshing in some shape or form, just not to this scale, not to what they're trying to accomplish. And so I would encourage you, I am not Evocati. I'm not. Um, I would encourage you to maybe follow somebody on social media who is. They're very loud um, about being one if they are. 
well, most of them are, um, which is exciting as a content creator for them because they get to see things um, ahead of time and prepare their shows and prepare their notes um, in a different way than like somebody like I can. But I would keep your ear close to the ground because here very, very soon, like I think next month, I think April, we're going to see 323 right the first month of q2 and when that happens like i said tech preview channel for server meshing replication layer and then that opens up the door for pyro in the summer do i think pyro is going to come this summer i don't know i mean i think so i think so if they're already this far and seeing this success uh, or these successes in replication layer and server meshing i i don't know i would not be surprised if Pyro does hit when they expect it to, right? June or July, in my opinion. Okay, back to this article. <laughs> um, let's go. We're also surfing the good vibes into this week after meeting so many of you this weekend at Bar Citizen Manchester. Nearly 200 of you came to hang out with devs, org mates, and good friends. Thanks to everyone for stopping by. We can't wait to do it again soon. Break. I'm going to try my best to attend the Austin Bar Citizen tomorrow on Saturday. I know Tyler is going to be there. I know Galactic is going to be there. Uh, again, I'm going to try my best to be there. I think Gabs is going to be there, one of the content creators um, as well. So it should be a pretty good experience. I think it's at Pinballs, whatever that is. I don't think I've ever been there before, but <laughs> here in Austin, 6 p.m. Saturday. So be there. Uh, if you see me there, say hi. I would love to meet you. Back to the article. In other news, Jumptown has begun pharmaceutical, quote unquote, production once again. Keep an eye out for a priority mission in your mobile glass and get your crew ready. That maze isn't going to sell itself. Don't forget to close your ramps. Yep. And watch the skies for incoming ordinance. We did it. Shitload of fun. Go listen to episode 11 if you just want two hours to kill and want some really good back and forth conversations in the community. We did uh, the first jump town several weeks ago. Um, we didn't really come into a lot of engagement or combat. We had to we had to take it over. There were already people there. We had to take it over and then we just held it for two hours. Last week, so Org Night 10, we didn't, I don't think we fought anybody. I think there was one person we assassinated. Thanks, Groza. Uh, but there's one person we assassinated who actually ended up being in the servers last night. That was super cool. <laughs> it was a kind of a cool tie-in. Um, besides that, we didn't have any engagements. But last night, we probably had three or four, I'm, I'm going to call them sorties. We had three or four engagements uh, with the community, which ended up being a lot of fun. All right. And I already went through this week, um, like the little bullet point schedule. Not going to do it again. Let's actually get into the subscriber promos. Here we go. All right. Um, this spoke my language. First off, at the beginning of the week, I predicted it would have some sort of connection with uh, Stella Fortuna, which again is the March 15th St. Patrick's Day celebration. Um and it, and it did. So you're going to get green paints. So you can see in this image in front of you, you're going to see some green paints on pistols and rifles. And then you're going to see tankards. So again, speaking of my language, I loved the tankards. So let's go. Subscriber promotions. Welcome to March, subscribers. There's loads going on throughout the month, including another battle in the ongoing war for Jumptown to help you in your pursuit of riches or righteousness. Every subscriber gets access to Tumbrel's Combat Ready Cyclone MT, while Imperators can also head to the labs in the versatile Crusader Mercury. This month's flair embraces the culture of Stella Fortuna, with fate tempting tankards and lucky green weaponry. So let's get into it. In game rewards, flair, you've got the fate tankard. This, uh, so this is gorgeous. And it's actually also my color scheme when it comes to like drinks and like elegance. I think I've said this before, but black and gold or black with gold etching or highlights. Absolutely my version of, uh, of luxury. I love these things and they look rustic and they look like they're used. Pretty cool. Can't wait to like have my persistent hanger that I get to decorate and have some sort of like set up with all of my whiskey glasses. Um, 
what else what else we had like a the radagast risky whiskey when you first become a concierge member right you get all these tankards there are many other i think there's like coffee cups right i'm gonna put it all on a freaking table <laughs> it's gonna be fun i'm excited about that but these are really uh really pretty love the etching love the decorations right so again that's for current centurion level subscribers uh for the current imperator level subscribers you get the tankard and you get the gemini c54 Luckbringer smg so this is the c54 smg uh with the green highlights so if you're familiar with the fortuna ship paints it's that ship paint green applied to the smg the yes yes <laughs> i had to think there i'm like smg you know i wanted to say shotgun it's not a shotgun okay so available in the store right 2954's luck lux favor tankard so this has more of like a, a rustic wooden feel like almost like a almost like a wine barrel or like a um yeah i'll, I'll I'll leave it there, like a wine barrel with metal etching. Um, it looks very, again, rustic, very cool. But again, you're gonna have to pay for this. And I think it's like $4, yep, it's $4 in the store. So I actually might end up buying that. Also available in the pledge store is the Gemini pistol, the LH86, with that same green. So you've got a Centurion tankard, an Imperator, uh, SMG, right? Machine gun, small machine gun. And then you've got a uh, store-bought tankard and a store-bought pistol. All right. And we already talked about the ships, the Cyclone MT, and then the Mercury. So the Mercury is a phenomenal ship. It's fun to just kind of explore in because, again, I've said this many times on the podcast, but it is a like a hidden... <laughs> a hidden compartment ship so you go into the the back of the garage if you immediately turn to your right one of the panels on the wall can retract right you go up to it you hold down f you click your little button and the the panel will rescind inside of the wall and you can actually get under the ship and like secret cargo and make your way throughout the entire ship and come up in the recreation center or what have you so I guess the question is like, why? Why is it there? And, and that's a fun question to ask. Clearly, it's going to be some sort of future game loop or they wouldn't have designed it in the ship. You already have data running. You have an entire server room you have to go through in order to get to your you know, pilot seat. So you know you're going to be data running with it. Cargo, obviously, because it's a, ma it's a massive garage, but this kind of hints at like an illegal cargo or maybe even like an illegal stowaway, like you're transporting a VIP, but maybe it's the, maybe it's the illegal version of transporting VIPs. I think there's a lot of potential with the Mercury. So if you get your hands on this, keep it um, in your inventory or keep it in your hangar because I do think it's going to have an amazing future in the game. So we kind of alluded, we kind of hinted about the Stella Fortuna, and I told you we would get into kind of the background. I want to preview it going into next week, so you're going to see on Monday, you're going to see all the, the fanfare around this event. Well, you heard it here first. It's, it's really a no-brainer. It's I mean, you can expect it. It's every March 15th, um, so you can expect it to be next week. It's not like one of those. I think the Red Festival... It's based around the Chinese New Year, so that's why it was not like on the same you know window every year. Let me clear my throat real quick. Whew, dying, dying over here. Um, so yes, March fifteenth. Let's actually get into the lore of it real quick. I'll be very fast with this lore reading, um, but again, we're previewing Stella Fortuna. After this, we'll get into the roadmap roundup. We'll get into the monthly report, and then we'll end, like I said, with the Inside Star Citizen video. So let's do this. Already sharing my screen for those of you on YouTube. Stella Fortuna is a human cultural celebration associated with good fortune and success in new ventures. It was first established as a commemoration of the successful colonization of Mars, Sol 4. Feasting, fireworks, festivals, and other forms of mass celebration are hallmarks of the holiday, along with the colors gold and green. 
It is celebrated each year on March 15th throughout the entire UEE origin. In the mid-22nd century, the people of Earth established humanity's first successful extraplanetary colony on Mars. This was the second attempt at colonization. The first human colony on Mars failed. It's a horrible, horrendous story. But it failed in the terraforming process when an error in the atmosphere pro uh, processors led to sudden mass atmospheric collapse. 4.9K humans died. The second attempt at a colony was largely regarded as doomed. In a widely circulated article on the potential dangers a Mars immigrant might face, Kelsey Forsett of Sentinel News Org simply wrote, Don't tempt fate. This message is ultimately co opted, quote, tempt fate, with don't crossed out, <laughs> became an unofficial slogan of the early Mars colonists. In 2200, multiple Earth-based governments announced plans for an interplanetary holiday to celebrate 45 successful years of human habitation on Mars. It would be held during the following Earth-Mars conjunction, 18th March 2202, to emphasize the connection between the planets. Martian school children were invited to submit possible names for the new holiday. Stella Fortuna was selected from an entry provided by Estelle Priya, age 11, of Port Renatas Public School 17. Large public carnivals sponsored by space travel and terraforming companies were held on Mars and Earth. They featured rides, food, games, and half-price tickets to attractions throughout the solar system, from space stations on the asteroid belt to the volcanoes of Lowe. <clears throat> that would be Io. Anyways, new parcels of land on Mars were raffled off to festival attendees, along with a ship outfitted with a quantum engine provided by RSI. Local businesses sold souvenirs stamped with the slogan, quote, We Tempted Fate, Stella Fortuna 2202. The day ended with a green and gold firework display. Stella Fortuna was held at varying times of the year during Earth-Mars conjunctions for over a half century. In 2257, the majority of governments on Earth and Mars declared March 15th the official holiday. While March 18th was initially proposed, it was not selected due to conflict with another holiday, the anniversary of the first human born on a planet other than Earth. Celebrations and Traditions the Stella Fortuna has evolved from a holiday commemorating the early Mars colony to one that celebrates good fortune, boldness, tempting fate, and embarking on new business ventures. This was caused by a number of factors, but the against all odds success of the Mars colony combined with the long-term success of early settlers were two major influences. In particular, the families who won land during the first Stella Fortuna did a great deal to promote the idea that the holiday was associated with good luck. By the time the holiday's final date was selected, people preparing for interplanetary trips were already asking the stars for their blessing. It became a tradition in the late 2200s for explorers to toast the stars before embarking on searches for jump points, or for people launching new business ventures to begin them on March 15th. The largest celebrations still occur on Mars. Most businesses close for the holiday and the day after. The festival officially kicks off with a parade featuring elaborately decorated floats in the form of spaceships or stars. Celebrants clad in colorful light up costumes throw candy, raffle tickets, or other small prizes from atop the floats into the crowd. Carnivals filled with rides and games run throughout the day and night. Intoxicated crowds will spontaneously burst into traditional songs such as Aim for the Stars but Strike from Mars and Illuminate the Way. Marriage proposals are as common as new business ventures. The green and gold firework display that concludes the festival is a favorite time to seal the deal on business and romantic partnerships alike. So there's the lore. <laughs> um, I, I love it. So I love how they do that. And, and it's not the first game. It's not unique to Star Citizen. But I love when they take in-game lore and apply it to like a holiday outside. And they tie in colors and they tie in some of those celebration traditions. Um, it's neat. It, it's it's St. Patrick's Day, It's right? Or it's St. Patrick's Month. Um, so this is appropriate. 
What I will tell you, and I don't want to get into numbers or specifics um, because I, th- I feel like they change all the time, but you will have the opportunity to get the Phoenix Emerald. So that's the const- the RSI Constellation Phoenix Emerald. It's the one time to get it. It is a super, super rare ship. And again, I'm gonna throw numbers out there. It's like around $300. So it's a limited whole ship for only $300. So if there was going to be an F5 war, this is absolutely gonna be it because it's more attainable. It's more affordable. And don't start <laughs> on arguing with me about you know affordability. Relative to the entire Star Citizen conversation, a $300 ship is affordable. <laughs> so. Anyways, so if you're going to sit there and tap F5, like this is going to be a nightmare for you. There are two packs that will drop for Stella Fortuna. There's going to be a an expensive one, which I'm not going to say the number. It's over $1,000. There's an expensive one, and then there's like a not so expensive. It's still pretty close to 1000 Those will both have lifetime insurance, RSI Constellation Phoenix Emeralds. That'll be the best way to get the ship. It's guaranteed. Those are not limited in that sense, but they also come with a phenomenal, a phenomenal set of ships. And then if you want to, you can take some of the smaller ships in that pack, like the Cyclone MT. You can take something like that and then save that for, I don't know, the Odyssey. Something that you want to transfer that LTI to like a more expensive ship and it just becomes part of that pack so that's personally what what i did melted the cyclone mt and i did i think i applied it to either the carrick or the odyssey i don't recall but that is a good way and it's like 11 ships by the way i'm pretty sure it's like 11 ships the more expensive one it's 11 ships so you can basically transfer 10 if you want to keep the phoenix emerald you can transfer like 10 of those LTIs to other ships. It's a very, very good pack to get. One of the ones I would recommend. I'm gonna stop there. (laughs) Because again, we don't have a lot of details going into this Stella Fortuna uh, for next week. So again, I'm gonna stop there. We can talk more about that in the next episode when this is live. Okay. So we have the roadmap roundup, the monthly report, and the Inside Star Citizen to get to. Because I'm already feeling like my throat and everything is going south, let's actually jump into Inside Star Citizen next. We're going to get into this, we're going to watch the video together, and then we will end with the roadmap roundup and the Star Citizen monthly report. Hopefully that sounds good. Otherwise, I don't know, because you can't talk to me right now. (laughs) <laughs> All right, Inside Star Citizen, sharing my screen for those of you on YouTube. Um, first person assertion, quote, reloading and recoil and scopes, oh my. Join us today as we explore many of the FPS combat related changes coming in Alpha 323. And again, I'm just going to say it pretty damn sure this is going to be next month in April when 323 launches. What do you see if we get started? Here we go. At first glance, Star Citizen is a game about spaceships. But when you look under the surface, we're really building a universe of the first person with trading and lading, exploration and devastation. And over the next few weeks, we'll be exploring such character related features as the new personal persistent hangers, new visor, lens, inventory and shopping apps, the character customizer, which is so good, I'm just gonna already tell you we're covering that next week and much more. But before we leave our combat era of ISC, this week, we're sitting down with members of Team Nuck. We really gotta get these new teams new names. Uh, to discuss all the FPS combat related changes coming in Alpha 323. Let's find out more. I want that helmet. I would totally wear it. I'm not above that. That would be awesome. Go on, man. Get the, get the power shot. It's a bit awkward sitting down. Oh, wow, dude, you're so cool. I know. My mom thinks I'm wet. I'm wicked, mate. (laughs) 
just a reminder, I have not seen this yet. So for those of you listening to the podcast, watching on YouTube, I actually don't know anything about this video. I hope they get into the new, and you're, you're seeing it on my screen. I hope they get into this like trailing iron sights or this, this aiming um, system that seems to be trailing or lagging. I want to know more about this. Hopefully they get into it. This game is 930 years in the future. Why does reloading matter? Reloading, I think, matters because from a player perspective, it makes you think ahead of the combat that you're about to go into. Because it's part of a classic FPS experience. I think it adds to the tactical element of gameplay, thinking on the fly, and it's also quite satisfying to reload weapons. I, I find it satisfying anyway. You give a little bit of thought that the situation you're going to put yourself into, it feels a bit more immersive. We obviously have a bit more of a complex system with our magazines, so we obviously have magazines on the suit, and we also have magazines in your backpack. You need to make sure that these magazines are as full as possible, so we are making you think ahead about the combat situation that you're going to go into. So for Alpha 323, um, reloading is kind of two parts. Uh, first, you've got your backpack reloading, and then you've got your ammo repooling. So backpack reloading solves uh, a problem where, for example, you find yourself in a situation in a combat, and you need to reload, but you don't have any spare mags on your suit, but you have in your backpack. What you can do now is pull additional magazines from your backpack at the cost of an increased reload time. It was just filling up a lot of your inventory, so we basically decided with um, Backpack Reloading that we wanted to kind of condense that gameplay and just do it more on the fly. It is a reload, but it takes a little bit longer. It's going to play a very simple animation. So the combat flow isn't broken, but you still need to think ahead because this long reload duration can be painful in the combat if you're not careful. I'm not sure any other game does that. And please uh, correct me if I'm wrong in the comment section, but I, I don't know another game that takes that into consideration. Now in real life, um, again, in like, you know, I, I served, I won't get into the details of how I served, but you have like an assault pack or like a 3D pack, but you have an assault pack that is different than your rucksack. So you might be thinking um, in a close quarters combat, you've got this massive backpack on, you might've watched a movie on Hollywood or some crap. Um, you, you won't draw a magazine from a rucksack. That's, that's, that's not gonna happen. But your kit going into close quarters combat, CQB, um, or CQC, it's it's different, and and you could you could take your assault pack and you could arm it up with a different set of equipment, like your E tool. You're not going to put your E tool on your assault pack. Your E tool goes on the outside of your rucksack, and even then, I mean, there's so many different ways of of setting up your gear in that sense. But the assault pack, yeah, you absolutely could put additional items um, on the outside, like like Kim, Kim lights, right? Those types of things we would have on the assault pack. You don't necessarily need them on your flak um, vest, right? But you can put on your assault pack. I think this is a very well thought out mechanism in FPS. I love it. Again, I don't know another game that's doing that. Because we really want to incentivize players to think about when they're going into combat, what they need to think about, how much magazines they want to keep on them and how much they want in their back. back. The last thing you really want to do is pull out, you know, open a UI and pull out magazines from here and move them across there. This allows you to keep in the combat, in the action, without having to go through inventory menus. You will be able to see how many magazines on your suit and how full they are, and a backpack icon if you have magazines on your backpack. And if you see no magazines icon, but a backpack icon, then you will understand that the next reload you're gonna do is going to be a backpack reload. So it keeps you in the flow, but it forces you to wait a little bit. The punishment of not preparing yourself is still there, but it's lighter, it's more forgiving. 
So with repooling, the idea being that if you've got lots of, let's say, if we take a 30 mag uh, ballistic magazine, let's say you've got 15, 15, 15, you've got three half empty magazines. The idea being is you just hit a key binding, the animation will play like a rummage, and basically those magazines will condense down into full magazines and then automatically discard the empty ones. As a result of this process, you will save your precious suit item ports and then you will have your ammo condensed into your fuller magazine, so you're ready to unleash their full potential onto your enemies. So with our new UI display HUD, we've basically got a number of the bullets in your magazine, and then we've also got a number of your combined bullets on your total player. And duration of this operation is going to depend on how much ammo you're shifting around and the type of ammo that you're shifting around. So repelling pistol magazines is going to take a different amount of time than repelling rockets, for example. That means Good. that we're spending less time in the inventory screen and more time actually in gameplay. This all will be Good. in 323, but after that, we will be looking into throwables and consumables. So you will be able to repool your grenades and your med pens. And there are still a couple of unclear points about some weapons, for example, multi-tool and its salvage canisters. We're still exploring what options we have over there. So recall is part of the identity of the weapon. And it will also allow players to express their skill in a certain way. We have different kinds of recoil, very subtle recoils and very wild recoils. And depending on that, you can paint an image of either this is a very harsh, very, very aggressive assault rifle or a very gentle pistol, maybe even with a silence on top of it. <laughs> when I've been watching Citizen Con, and we showed the new recoils. One of the biggest feedbacks was, those are laser weapons. They don't have recoil. Oh, God, if, if I see one more form post about, like, why do laser guns not? Well, why, why don't laser guns have recoil? It drives me up the wall. Laser weapons in the first place, like we have them, are really unrealistic for themselves, right? There are no big laser projectiles that come out of weapons. So giving them recoil is very sensible for a game. I think getting rid of recoil in that sense is just boring gameplay. It's fun. It needs to be in there. You know, you need a challenge when shooting people. You need a challenge when tracking people. I think you need recoil in order to balance the game and make it fun for everybody. You'll see in 322, we put the new procedural recoil in, and it looks mint, I think, personally. Uh, the weapons now use our entirely new procedural system. And the nice thing about the procedural system is it means that we can basically have shot-to-shot -shot differences be massive. So you'll see when you fire the P4 now, it can basically be an entirely different bit of your screen than it was in the previous shot. Whereas before, we had a very linear motion. Imagine before the recoil would essentially go like this on your camera. But now it can be, you know, kind of doing this all around the place far more aggressive and the overall feeling of it is like, oh my God, this is actually a gun. So some of this is in 322 and some more is coming in 323. So for example, the sniper rifles, these are gonna have, uh, the majority of the sniper rifles will have the new procedural recoil and the majority of the pistols will have the new procedural recoil. So you'll see some of the pistols, their, their personality will have changed a little bit, but their functionality will still be the same and you'll see the snipers basically feeling a lot more powerful and angry as you've seen with the other weapons that have had their passes. And with the new recoil system, this just feels like a real weapon and it feels like this, this thing just has impact, right? You know, you want your weapon to feel angry. If the weapon is just stable and still on the screen, you'd be like, oh, this feels pants. So we have not only just scopes, we have a whole new suite of iron sights for the majority of our weapons. So what this has done is we've essentially got stuff that has raised the camera upwards and given a better target acquisition window. This is obviously with a lot of sci-fi guns. They're very chunky, they're very kind of fat, which is just how a lot of sci-fi things are. So naturally, we've managed to improve upon this by saying, hey, you've still got that fat chunkiness, but we've raised the camera up and we've managed to make this the sight line cleaner for your, for example, your Kana rifle. On the scope side of things, we've basically overhauled how they work. So 
previously, if you were looking at anything that is, you know, an eight times or above, it would basically have a black border around the actual scope bit itself. But now that is gone. The graphics guys did an amazing job at implementing the shaders for these, so the scopes just look way more realistic than they used to be. All right, uh, here, here's my deal, and I'm gonna become one of those people. But look at my image on this screen right now. It makes sense that the that the actual scope is zoomed in, and the image you're seeing through the lens is zoomed in. But the outside of the scope should not be zoomed in. And so there's a couple of things I've noticed. Some games do this and some games don't. But when you zoom in with like a sniper rifle or, you know, four times, eight times, um, you know, powered scope, they, they, they'll do the whole thing and you lose, you lose all awareness of what's around you. And I, I just, again, another realistic um, experience pulled from, from my time in the military, like you, you shoot with both eyes open. Uh, it's a skill that you have to acquire. It's not like you're going to go to the gun range just, you know, casually and be able to do this. But, you know, hours and hours and hours, I would say up to years, you know, behind a scope, you get used to shooting with both eyes open. You do that because it keeps your awareness of what's happening around you. In this screenshot right here, you got the powered scope. It looks like they're looking at something 46 meters away and it's pulled the entire image up to that 46 meters right against the lens but this outside needs to still be negative 46 meters it would be hard to again you're gonna have to get used to it but that is a very realistic approach to scopes it's very disorienting to be running through an objective and you know tapping your right mouse button to zoom and your entire screen is going back and forth as opposed to just the viewfinder inside of your scope. I don't know. Just my reactions to most games, not even Star Citizen, but most games that deal with shooting in scopes, you should not lose right your awareness around around the scope. Nice reflections and a parallax effect. This is something different. Just a gorgeous view. I can't wait for you guys to see them. It's probably the most exciting thing for me personally in 323. If you look through the scope, you actually see the scope inside. And depending on if it's a holographic scope, a telescopic scope, or a TV screen scope, the shader will look different as well. And then we took it and brought it to basically every scope, adjusted the shader so that it looks nice on that particular scope, and added a few other functionalities to scopes as well. For example, we will have multiple zoom levels on scopes. Currently, we just have eight times zoom, but in the future, for 323, we will be able to have eight times and 16 times zoom or two times and four times zoom. And because our new recoil is a lot more aggressive and dynamic, it means that the reticle is moving as you'd expect on screen relative to where the actual barrel is. So not only does it help with the new procedural recoil, it also helps with the believability of the optics as well. So I think the whole scope experience or ADS experience with scopes- That looks a lot better. Gonna get better from here on. ADS is aiming down sights, for those of you curious. Dynamic Crosshair is also coming in Alpha 323. Dynamic Crosshair is it's in the name of the Crosshair, but the good thing about, about our Crosshair is it's a little more futuristic, a little bit more sci-fi. So in 323, when you equipped a combat visor, you will have a dynamic Crosshair on your screen. This follows the barrel of the gun, which is really cool because if you're reloading and you pull the gun up like that, the Crosshair will actually go off screen like that. So it fits into the aesthetic of Star Citizen because it's grounded in the context of where the barrel actually yeah, is. That's not which bad Which is at really all. cool because if you've got a pistol which shoots a bit more up like this, it actually fo follows it as you would expect. Previously, you were always kind of point shooting and it causes a problem in not knowing how big your crosshair actually is for your weapon. So we had to make the, the spread on the weapons a bit smaller than usual because if you're going to point shoot, have the issue of like where is my bullet actually going to go 
this allows us to say, hey, this is actually kind of what your, you know, your cone of spread is, and we can increase the spread values of weapons themselves, which leads to better gameplay and people actually focusing on ADSing down sites, even in like 10 meter engagement ranges. And it also just gives that player a little bit of extra information. So when you're hiding behind a wall or um, you're close to uh, proximity with an object, the crosshair is actually going to let you know if you're going to hit the object or if you're going to shoot past it. I heard people saying this is unrealistic. I'm fairly certain we can do this with our technology today. So 900 years in the future shouldn't be a problem to have at least military tech to have this crosshair component to them. It's a crosshair that not only fits the aesthetic of Star Citizen, but cleanly fits into what you'd expect for Star Citizen as well. We are able to deactivate it, so if you don't like it, there's a menu option for you. You can also disable the new hit markers independently of the crosshair. So if you just prefer to keep the hit markers, you can keep them. If you prefer to keep the crosshair and not the hit markers, you can do that as well. So you can fully utilize it to make it your own, what you want from the game. So you can have it completely off or on. And then we have things like obviously updated hit markers. And we also have a final hit red X as well to let you know that you've confirmed that kill. It's a completely optional feature, but I think you're going to like it. So I really like what they just said about confirming the kill. Um, and, and maybe it's not needed in the future, but in this current state, like you don't know when you kill somebody because they, they do this long ass animation falling to the ground. So it'd be nice to not sit there and waste rounds and waste time on a body that's falling. But that red X showing that you've actually, you know, successfully canceled that person. <laughs> Um, that's going to be welcomed. I'm, I'm, I'm going to like that, personally. So I think the reason why I'm so excited and the team is so excited about why these new changes to FPS are going to be so dynamic and, and completely change the game is I just think it makes our game so much more modern. It makes it so much more lively uh, and really expressive. Now weapon manufacturers are going to have much more of a unique brand to them. And the same with, the, uh, with our new amazing scopes. You know, if you compare the scopes that we have now uh, to what we have coming in 3.23, it is going to be completely, I think, game-changing. Uh, we're obviously going to do things in the future, like when we get wear and tear in, apply wear and tear to when you shoot those things, because we still... Oh, no. OK. So I support it. I support it. I support wear and tear. I do. Oh, but they got to get this right. <laughs> they've they've got to get this right because there are some games that that just becomes so tedious, almost to the point where it dissuades you from even you know going on a mission. So uh, they've got to they got to really do the economy of it right um, and what it's uh, what it's asking of players in their time. Again, I support it. They just they've got to do it right. Want that to be be a believable experience. Bullet blocking is an issue. It will literally be gone from like grenades and magazines and everything like that. So even backpacks. So people previously would have to shoot people in the legs if they wanted to consistently land shots, which is a problem because realistically that's not a good feeling of like I'm behind you, I have to shoot you in the legs so I can focus on shooting you in the chest now. We really like the fact that the crosshair is basically kind of starting the whole archetypes for armors. So as we move down into the PU, we want our armor sets to become uh, more specific to their units. If you look at our game, half of this is basically FPS combat. And these improvements will bring the FPS combat to AAA standard and make it feel like, yeah, more polished experience. It's not something that you can put into words, but something that will, yeah, that you will appreciate while playing our game. And I hope all of these changes make your time in the verse more fun. I think this just is so much more about gameplay. It's less about getting bogged down in menus. It's more about on the action. And it also integrates so amazingly with our HUD. A fluid experience, which is what we're aiming for, which is what we, you know, really want to deliver. I'll see you in a bit. Oh, I have to get the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> so what did we learn this week? We probably can't do this in a helmet. We learned that procedural recoil system reaches all FPS weapons in Alpha 323. That the dynamic crosshair will enable some occasional hip fire goodness. That new scopes means better ways to refund your enemies' lives. And that reloading changes means more of the pew pew 
and less of the few, few. Sometimes I hate me too. For Inside Star Citizen, I'm Jared nice. Huckabee. Thanks nice. for letting us share the process of game development with you. And we'll see you all here next week. For the character customizer. <laughs> uh, character customizer is going to be awesome. I'm looking forward to that and the beards that come with it. So I just naturally, naturally brushed my beard when I said beard. That's awesome. Uh, I can't wait for the FPS piece. Um, that's... Again, I feel I feel like um, almost like I alluded at the beginning of this podcast. I feel like a lot of people are going to get into three twenty three, and then they're going to be like, "Okay, all right, what's next? Nothing's really new. It's cosmetics have changed, but I I need us to stop and smell the roses. <laughs> like I I need us to take a moment uh, when this does happen, when three twenty three happens, and appreciate the change." I started this podcast, what, around like this time last year, March 2023. And this game has made so much progress in this last year. I'm not even going to go through the list right now. That's a next week thing. But so much progress in starting this podcast. And and some of it needs to be like, let's say the bare minimum. Some of it needs to be this low bar of being where other games are at. I mean, honestly, it's what Starfield didn't do, right? At least be as good as every other game. At least be as good. And so this 323, I feel like, gets us to that at least as good as every other game. The cosmetics, the way scopes work, aiming, reloading, the realism, and giving up that realism where it makes sense. I think all of that is really good, uh, and it needs to come. It needed to have come a long time ago, but they're just now doing it, and again, because of Squadron 42 and all the work that they have done to grow Squadron 42. All right, and I actually like this cadence. I actually liked putting Inside Star Citizen like right in the middle of the cadence because it allows me time to drink and get my throat right. <laughs> um, so that might be what we do moving forward. Instead of ending with ISC, we'll throw ISC kind of right in the middle and then use the rest of the show to kind of wrap things up. But here we go. Roadmap Roundup and the Star Citizen Monthly Report. Kind of all in the same conversation. Uh, but let's, let's, let's do this. Let me go ahead and start getting my screens ready because I did not have the roadmap view up. Okay. Sharing my screen for those of you on YouTube. Roadmap Roundup quote happy wednesday everyone every two weeks we accompany the roadmap update with a brief explanatory note to give you insight into the decision making that led to any changes this is part of an effort to be transparent all right let's go this is a short one right the following cards have been added to release view targeting an alpha 323 release window again targeting an alpha 323 release window doesn't necessarily mean it's coming with 323.0 but just at some point in 323. Image upscaling, implementing support for GPU upscaling, including DLSS, FSR, and in-house TSR solution. Yes, optimization, right? So both of these additions to the roadmap um, update, it's all about optimizing and making things better for what they currently have. So like the next item, the volumetric clouds updates. Right now, me and my friends, at least a lot of my friends that play this game, we've turned off the volumetric clouds because of how much it bogs down our system. You can't really do you know, ship combat in the clouds, at least I can't in the current rig that I have. And so we just turn off clouds altogether, which is sad because the volumetric clouds are so phenomenal. They are so well done and it adds to that immersive, amazing feel. I also have a terrifying like nightmare of flying through the clouds like at nighttime with a thunder lightning storm and then a freaking space whale shows up right in the middle of your screen. Uh, there's, I don't know, there's something about that that just will probably make me die inside. <laughs> um, you know, I referenced this before, but like thalassophobia is a thing. Um, that's going to be it, right? But we've had to turn off the volumetric clouds because of this. And so this next update, 
updating Star Citizen's volumetric cloud technology to improve overall visual quality, including the addition of both volumetric shadows as well as the implementation of ground fog. So yes, making things, the experience, the immersion just a little bit better using graphics and those types of immersion tools. This just needs to be optimized because my computer can't take it anymore. <laughs> uh, and my computer, to be fair, is like six or seven years old. So it's probably time that I, uh, yeah, that I do something about that. So we'll go straight into the roadmap roundup, straight into the release view. So this is always good. I love reminding everybody what is coming up in 323. So in theory, you could just look at this for the roadmap roundup and the monthly report and have all the information that you need. It's a very good user-friendly um, tool or visual aid, whatever you want to call it. But here we go. So tentative. So 323 is still tentative for Q2 2024. Again, I'm calling April. Let's look at characters. The new character customizer, which will be the topic for ISC next week. You heard it from Jared himself. Locations, distribution centers, hell yes, that is what I'm looking forward to the most. Gameplay, here we go, there's 17 gameplay entries. Um, I'm going to go quickly. Arena Commander, new flight map, Miner's Lament. Arena Commander, engineering experimental mode, yes, yes. Arena Commander, Grav Royale, Arena Commander, custom lobbies, personal and instanced hangars, yes. Moby Glass rework, FPS loot screen, FPS map system, new missions, cargo hauling. That's going to be fun, especially for those of us who have a whole C that have kind of been waiting for a purpose to fly it. Awesome. The dynamic event blockade runner. So get your MSRs out. Get your Mercury's out. That's going to be a lot of fun. Blockade runner. Go. Visor and lens HUD rework. Player interaction experience. EVA. Uh, the next version of ETA, uh, EVA. Reputation hostility. Good. Star map rework. Yes, absolutely need the star map to be anything but it is today anything what it is item bank and unique item recovery that gives us a reason to get subscriber items and actually use our subscriber items can't wait for that to happen freight elevators phenomenal ships and vehicles the number one contentious conversation right now on socials master modes <laughs> i don't know i'll get into my opinion about that later i'm still trying to gather my thoughts uh, i think overall it's good but i want to have a i want to have a a uh, a well thought through response uh, whenever I do want to address that, but in current mode, I welcome it. Weapons and items, dynamic core uh, crosshair, and then core tech. Here's the new stuff: the volumetric clouds update, the image upscaling, thing gone, and the replication layer update. There you go. And while we're here, let me just exit through these screens and let's get through the monthly report and call it a podcast. Here we go. Star Citizen Monthly Report for February. I'm going to read hot and heavy. Pause where it makes sense. Sharing my screen for those of you on YouTube. Let's go. AI Features Team. As mentioned in last month's report, AI Features continue to develop features for a key initiative, the first iteration of which is planned for Alpha 323. Further details will be revealed in the run-up to release. Thanks for the tease and not giving us any information on that one. AI Tech. <laughs> During February, AI Tech focused on a variety of improvements alongside feature work, including for the navigation system. The main focus of this was on extending the planetary navigation mesh to be able to generate across a whole planet. Due to a limitation of the initial implementation, it currently has a latitude limit at which navigation tiles can be created. However, with a new approach, nav mesh can be generated anywhere on the planet following physics terrain patches. The devs are currently improving the tile border simplification step to make sure all nav mesh tiles connect correctly with each other. Nav mesh is how we get NPCs planet side. Can't wait for that. For NPCs using trolleys, focus was on the exact positioning of trolleys in the environment. Now, an NPC can correctly push a trolley to a location with an arbitrary orientation. The team also improved transit and elevator usage while pushing trolleys so that the overall flow is more robust and fluid. Spaceship behaviors were also iterated on to deliver better ship versus turret combat. Fighters will now correctly target standalone turrets and perform appropriate combat behaviors. Numerous updates were added to the uh, Apollo tool. Apollo? 
Apollo. Yeah, Apollo tool. <laughs> uh, Apollo. Apollo tool, such as improved feedback for errors and missions. For example, the overall box that represents a function turns red when the logic contains errors. The team also increased usability when navigating between mission callbacks, allowing the designers to jump to the appropriate logic for multiple elements of the interface. A new UI for the subsumption tool is underway too. AI tech continued to support PU releases, while an important upcoming feature continued development, which can be experienced in Alpha 3.23. Again, I love the subtle, like, <laughs> in another feature that is coming with 3.23. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for not adding to our excitement. All right, art ships. That is the Zeus, ladies and gentlemen. That is the Zeus. Can't wait to see it in the universe. All right. Last month, progress was made on the RSI Polaris. Hell yeah. With the exterior progressing to Lodo, level of detail zero, and the interior approaching its gray box review. Some interior sections were worked up to establish a visual target, while others were redesigned to accommodate gameplay and improve alignment with the art direction. Two upcoming variants progress through the pipeline, one continuing its Lodo Pass, the other passing the Lodo Gate review. The latter then moved on to the final damage and LOD pass, low of detail pass, while its UV2 and paints were completed and approved. The gold standard pass continued for the Aegis Retaliator, which is currently awaiting gray box gate review. Feedback from a recent sanity review is currently underway. The ship's base cargo and bombing torpedo modules are also progressing well, following minor art direction feedback. Two unannounced vehicle passed, vehicles passed their Lodo gate reviews with only one minor issue to resolve between them. Both will now move into the final phase of development that implements damage meshes and LODs. Hmm. I wonder what those are. And here we go, RSI Zeus. The RSI Zeus is approaching the end of gray box with the team polishing geometry around the ship. A redesign of the cargo hold is nearly complete, as are changes to the inner frame of the ramp and ramp uh, piston mechanism. Additional high frequency detail was added to help increase the illusion of inner structures between the exterior hull and chassis, while maneuvering thrusters on the nose were moved to allow for better integration into the surface. A redesign of the ship-to-ship -ship docking ring door and frame was done to better fit the RSI aesthetic, while the mess hall was highly polished. The ship's habitation is currently being updated. The central hallway bulkheads were widened to allow for better navigation and consistency too. Polish was completed on another new ship, while yet another progressed through white box, gray box, and Lodo. A final lighting pass will be done soon before damage and level of detail work. There's a lot there that we just unpacked. There's like two new vehicles, two unannounced vehicles. Polish was completed on another ship. There's a lot of unknowns that was dropped in that paragraph. So we should see a lot of ships uh, in, in this year, in this near future. Weapon art worked through a host of updates planned for Alpha 323, including scope magnification and optic improvements. The aim, eh? See what they did there? The aim is to overhaul the whole scope system to bring it up to modern FPS standards. The existing iron sights across all weapons were updated as well. Alongside this, updates were made to improve and streamline reloading across all weapons. Community. The community team supported two major events in February, the Red Festival and Cormor, the latter with a first date in the first screenshot contest and a guide to enjoying activities together. Hundreds of pictures and videos taken by the community during the event are available to view on the community hub. The team then supported various community events, I'm skipping over the quote. The community team continued detailing the weekly and monthly schedules with this week in Star Citizen, this month in Star Citizen. They also officially announced CitizenCon 2954, which returns to Manchester, UK, October 19th through 20. October 18th, if you want to be part of the additional event. The team is already deep in planning for the event and want to remind you to not miss this one. Finally, the team, I, I'm, I would welcome somebody paying for my uh, flight. <laughs> but otherwise, I've said this once and I'll say it again, I'm not gonna budget for this trip. That's, that's a lot of money um, 
that I'm budgeting in other parts of my family in my life. So, but that plane ticket from Austin, Texas to Manchester, I think that might be a deal breaker for me. I will enjoy this from the comforts of my office and watching it on Twitch and YouTube. All right. Finally, the team updated the Arena Commander schedule, which keeps players up to date with Arena Commander's rotating game modes. They also have been working on a variety of initiatives to support the upcoming release of Alpha 323 4.0 and beyond. Core gameplay. This is a long one. February saw the core gameplay pillar continuing to refine and improve new backpack reloading ahead of QA testing. For example, magazines are now repacked in a player's inventory, so multiple half-empty mags are condensed into fewer ones. Support continued for the ongoing scope updates, including correctly folding down iron sights when sights are attached. Support for blur on the outside of sights is currently underway. The team also enabled the weapon customization UI to look more holographic instead of a UI styling pass. For item wear and misfire, further work was completed on the accumulator system. Additional tools were implemented to make working and testing the system easier too. The player interaction, the team spent, or four player interaction, the team spent a lot of time bug fixing and polishing. Here's a very important quote that's going around the community. They also added a game option to hide the F prompt and added a new control hint for when an off screen interaction is available. There you go. There was a lot of people who really champion immersion. They really love immersion. And that F prompt was destroying their immersion. And I 100% agree with them. Moving on. The devs then added the ability to show the loot screen from the interaction wheel. Players will also now auto crouch if the object they're loading is below them. Thank God. <laughs> like when there's like a box on the floor, like you have to actually hit control to get down into a crouch position and then loot. Just let me loot it standing up. Do whatever you need to do to make it immersive. But man, I don't have to I don't have to go through like 10 steps to loot. So beautiful. Love it. Support was added to automatically open the inventory UI instead of the loot screen if the lootable container is above a certain capacity as well. The team are working on a replacement for the legacy quick buy UI using building blocks. This is uh, this will also be used for renting vehicles during events. Work continued on the freight elevator kiosk UI backend as well. For the ongoing visor lens HUD rework, progress continued on various UI elements including priority notifications, mission objectives, and chat. Regarding EVA, Core gameplay continued to implement and improve networking support and ensured that players' arms and held entities don't clip into their torsos when traversing and rotating. For prone, players will now be forced out when they perform actions that require them to crouch, such as a melee attack. Further locomotion improvements were made in collaboration with the animation team, too. For master modes, core gameplay continued working with design and tune archetypes. They have so far completed around 90% of the initial conversion, uh, with further tuning passes and refinement to be done before release. Work continued on jump points, with the team implementing an updated alignment mechanic. A new UI was also added to give players information on whether their ships are capable of completing travel. Successful tests transi transitioning between Stanton and Pyro across two separate servers were completed too. For the resource network and engineering, uh, heat gameplay was added, which enables items to generate heat based on their usage. Items will be required. Oh, wow. Items will require coolant if necessary and will overheat and degrade in functionality if not addressed. Life support is now fully integrated into the resource network, with the life support generator and tank now functional. Improved debugging tools were added for the room system to help better understand how the resource network and life support interoperate. For radar and scanning, core gameplay completed an important refactor to reduce the number of radar components on vehicles and shared data between seat operators. Previously, each seat operator had a unique radar. Now vehicles can share a single radar across all operators. This means that a pilot or radar operator can focus on collecting radar and scan results that are then shared between all vehicle turrets, rather than each turret needing to scan for themselves. While it's still possible for vehicles to contain multiple radars, in time the team will merge the majority into a single shared unit that will not only improve performance but gameplay as well. 
The team also supported elevators for the upcoming instance tangers and supported quantum travel and markers working alongside server meshing when transitioning to a new solar system. We are still on core gameplay. For Arena Commander, the team concluded engineering work for streaming. This technology will allow Arena Commander to utilize any persistent universe location with ease and avoid duplicating planets or another object or other object containers, which was previously required to call expensive locations, such as cities and space stations. The engineering work for custom lobbies is nearing completion. Following successful internal tests, the system is being handed off to QA for release assessment. The team also began work on some basic custom settings, such as score limit, time limit, and match cycle options to provide players with more control over their lobbies. Several internal tests were conducted on engineering experimental modes. I personally find this super important. Several internal tests were conducted on engineering experimental modes after an update to the backend matchmaker. New loadouts were created with all the equipment engineers will need for the mode which is being prepared for a go no go for an upcoming release. I cannot wait for engineering experimental mode. That's going to be so amazing in Arena Commander. The team will also begin focusing on the Arena Commander front end. Finally, the team <laughs> this is this is long. Finally, the team completed the back end work required for Grav Royale and other upcoming game modes and maps. They also continued to enable streaming across all maps while supporting the release of Alpha 322.1 with several fixes and quality of life changes. Core gameplay continued working on an underlying mission system or factor ahead of server meshing, for the progress was made on the mission perks and reward systems too. An update was made to reputation-based hostility, ensuring that if someone is being attacked, any nearby allied or security faction members will come to their defense. This also means that factions will negative with negative reputation with the attacked players will not intervene. The contracts manager was converted to building blocks in preparation for the new Moby Glass. Further polish and UX improvements are currently underway in collaboration with the UI team. For persistent and instanced hangers, work began on the instanced interior system. This manages which hangar instances exist, need to be created, and which physical gateways are used to transition between the instances and rest of the game world. The team implemented the initial version of automated cargo loading and unloading, including displaying information on ASOP terminals that the ship is currently unavailable for retrieval due to being loaded or unloaded. Progress was also made on the freight elevator and loading platform Occlusion logic, which determines, mm, which determines where items can be placed on the elevator or platform. Support was also given to the locations team for marking up hangars with loading platforms and freight elevators. Finally, for core gameplay, the team worked on various debug tools to aid in testing and debugging the various systems that drive instanced hangers, the warehouse system, and loading platforms. Good God, that team needs a raise. <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot. Good work, team. Economy. Last month, the Economy team made changes to bring Salvage more in line with the PU's other careers. They're currently rebalancing commodities to improve the cargo career experience too. Support was also provided for the Xenothreat global event, and the team began looking at FPS ammo prices. Graphics, VFX programming, and Planet Tech. Throughout February, the graphics team progressed with their longer-term tasks. For example, work is nearing completion on the unification of gas cloud and planet cloud upscaling, though challenges caused by animated lights and glass clouds need to be solved. The gas cloud occlusion effect is also nearing completion, which will increase the detail level of all gas clouds, even in flat-lit scenarios. The team also resolved a long-standing issue that caused a harsh line to appear when 600 meters from where a gas cloud bends with the near fog system. The global illumination team continued to work on a system of approximate to approximate complex materials within a ray traced view of the world. Last month, they began looking into performance improvements before tackling some of the more complex issues like moving objects and zones. February saw the Vulcan team pushing hard towards release, working through various performance issues such as compiler bugs caused by Vulcan's complex shaders. They also worked on a shader caching... Mm, 
like a server cache server caching mechanism to compile shaders while the game is loading to avoid hitches they're also considering whether this process can later run in the patcher to further reduce the chance of compiling when the game starts although progressing this may not be fully complete by the initial public release devs from the water strike team closed out the issue that came up in their final review alongside several new features, including SDF interaction for accurate collisions when ve vehicles hit water and an improved water in uh, intersection shader. Goodness. Last month, the Planet Tech team began improving the editor workflow for creating planets and planning out the next version of Planet Tech version 5. Planet Tech V5 will cover a variety of areas, but the primary goal goals are to make creating planets quicker and easier and try and achieve more diversity, density, and consistency and quality across whole planetary surfaces. The rest of the graphics team focused on improving their upscaling tech ahead of its public release. This involved finalizing a new server mesh that gives major performance improvements. Whew, lighting. <laughs> February saw the lighting team continue to support various upcoming PU initiatives, including distribution centers, instance hangers, freight elevators, and the new character customizer. And this is a really awesome photo from the lighting team. Uh, it almost looks like the inside. It almost looks like the inside of a distribution center or a refinery. But yeah, the lighting is sexy. All right, locations, EU. In February, the landing zone team worked with the feature team to finalize the working prototype for cargo and the new hangar experience. Final art and uh, LODs, uh, level of details, are now nearing completion on all the modifications to hangars necessary for this exciting new feature. The Sandbox 2 team work toward closing out the upcoming distribution centers. For example, art is being finalized and optimized while level design added the final tweaks to make sure the various areas can support all the gameplay and mission team want to add. Mission design. Last month, mission design continued to work on a chain that comprises various mission types that skill and difficulty. Elsewhere, designs for new missions are currently being signed off while content and technical requirements are underway for future hauling content. The development of Xenothreat 1.2 continued with changes to gameplay and the implementation of freight elevators while Blockade Runner received polish and the implementation of freight elevators. Narrative. All right, we got a couple more. Narrative. February saw a flurry of mission work as Narrative focused on the upcoming Alpha 323 patch. Alongside UI and hint text, Many of the new gameplay features will have the corresponding missions, and the team have been working closely with design to develop narrative players with ex well, uh, will experience. Wow. Design to develop the narrative players will experience. For example, the new distribution centers feature a wide variety of missions, new and old. Additionally, narrative work began on the new pyro-based missions to help expand the gameplay in its various locations. Looking further forward, progress continued on future story missions. These will be more involved than typical missions, featuring things like bespoke dialogue and custom logic. The hope is that these types of missions will serve to build out the story of the wider universe and work alongside the more traditional systemic uh, missions. Last month, the narrative design team continued to develop the tourist behaviors that will bring new life to Star Citizen's large and world events. Finally, several new narrative posts were published, including a Whitley's Guide to the Valkyrie and a fresh batch of Galactopedia articles. Research and Development In February, the R&D team continued to work on the temporal, the temporal render mode. History filtering was switched to a custom bicubic filter to avoid diffusion and resampling blur due to repeated history lookups. Care was also taken to eliminate potential ringing artifacts during strong camera movements. The temporal filtering of transmittance was improved to avoid glowing thin silhouettes around objects and foregrounds with clouds and the sun behind them. Various improvements were made to preserve history details for as long as possible. Slow movement, no significant cloud, disoculation, etc. And to quickly coverage a full resolution image in case history needs to be rejected. Tech art and animation. And then we go FX and we're done. 
Tech art animation. Last month, the tech animation team focused on refining head assets and cleaning up technical debt around their implementation. This comes as a precursor to polishing head assets and refining eye alignment in the editor to ensure characters look as good as possible. Further to this, a large contingent of the department is working on assets set up for lockers. These will be placed throughout the verse and allow players and NPCs to change their apparel to something more appropriate to their current priorities. Love it. The team also kicked off initiatives to ensure the health of the build remains stable and triage technical debt built up over the course of the project. Visual effects. Last month, the VFX team continued to work on several upcoming locations, including freight elevators and distribution centers. They also investigated an issue with planetary ground storms where fog was coming in too thick when light winds arrived. Although it, <clears throat> excuse me, although it's difficult to balance dynamic events such as this, it will be easier for players to see where they are going if a storm is relatively mild. Good God. <laughs> I always love reading those. Y'all know my heart. You know why I love reading those. Um, it is the passion of the game that we are all backing. Um, it's just a lot. <laughs> it's a lot of information. But, but but here's the deal. Like when it's all said and done, like I said in the last episode, it, it's over. Once they get through everything and they release everything and we're in 4.0 or I mean, heck, at that point, Star Citizen 1.0, like in the live version, um, these these updates are going to be significantly smaller, less important, and are going to be looking more towards like expansions or DLC or whatever you want to call them. Not saying it's happening, not saying it's planned, but whatever we call like the next iterations. I love the story of development. Your primary... Your, 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 your primary source of development uh, conversation is Inside Star Citizen. You need to watch that, become intimately involved in the Inside Star Citizen so you can learn more about what the teams are doing and how they're doing it and why they're doing it. Um, but I love going through the notes line by line, and hopefully that provides you an opportunity to listen to it wherever you are, uh, which is a great segue in wrapping this one up. So for episode 49... I'm Solos with Beyond the Verse Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. I hope this has found you well. If you want to become part of the conversation, you can email us at contact at beyondtheversehq.com. You can answer our Q&A and polls over at Spotify. Please do so. We try to read through each one of those at the beginning-ish, one of the first segments in each episode. And you can also follow our socials, all social media platforms at forward slash BTV underscore cast. Again, if you're looking for an organization, we do one night a week because I think I think we're all really old adults uh, with kids and responsibilities. So right now it's only Thursday nights, uh, but we are growing. Uh, at Soul Provision, you can join us at www.robertspaceindustries.com forward slash orgs forward slash provision. Again, I hope this has found you well. I will be asking uh, for questions you have of me for next week's episode. It's going to be our 50th episode, an anniversary episode, and I would love for you uh, to provide those segments for me. Questions you may have, literally anything's on the table. I will answer every question that is asked, and you can do so by responding to that Spotify Q&A. So I hope this finds you well. Safe travels as you traverse beyond the verse. Take care, everybody.